Street Photography Festival. I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank also History Miami Museum and Laika USA, Laika Store Miami, and Image Pro for they have been great partners and we're very thankful and we're uh, able to offer this uh, festival for you guys. So thank you for being here. I know there are a lot of things going on out there tonight in Miami. So I'm very happy that you're here. We have a great speaker tonight. I'm very happy to introduce him. Um, Martin Parr is a documentary photographer and photojournalist known for his photographic projects that take an intimate, satirical, and anthropological look at aspects of modern life. Since 1994, Martin has been a member of Magnum Photos and is the current president of the agency. He has had 40 photo books published and has been featured in about 80 exhibitions worldwide. At first glance, his photographs seem exaggerated or even grotesque. The motifs he chooses are strange, the colors are garish, and the perspectives are unusual. His term for the overwhelming power of published images is propaganda. He counters this propaganda with his own chosen weapons, criticism, seduction, and humor. As a result, his photographs are original and entertaining, accessible and understandable. But at the same time, they show us in a penetrating way how we live, how we present ourselves to others, and what we value. Please help me welcome Martin Barr. <laughs> Years. 
I'll just show you some of the pictures now. I went and bought these very kitsch frames from places like Woolworths. And I got fascinated by the whole way in which we see photography in people's living rooms. One of the things you always see are wedding photographs. So I decided I would photograph Princess Anne on the television in someone else's living room, and then I put these photographs into my living room. <laughs> Uh, something else you often see in living rooms are plates with photographs on. Think of people like uh, the Pope or John F. Kennedy. So I, I went out and photographed uh, young girls who were bopper girls who were fans of people like the Bay City Rollers. Uh, these are black and white photographs, hand coloured and then stuck on an inappropriate plate. <laughs> Now, I'm an obsessed photographer. I think anyone who gets on in the arts has to be obsessed. And I get my obsessional genes from my father, who is an obsessed bird watcher. And when I was at college, I used to go out with him. He was the president of the Surrey Bird Club, and this is a photograph from one of those bird club outings. <laughs> so in 1975, I moved to a small town called Hebden Bridge, which lies in the north of England. And I moved there with some colleagues from the Oops. Oh. Ah, I moved there uh, with some colleagues also from the art college and we set up the Albert Street workshop together. And as you walked into the Albert Street workshop, on the right hand side, I had my own wall and here I posted up the photographs that I'd taken as I went along. So for that five year period, I had a constantly changing exhibition of the photographs that I'd taken in and around Heaven Bridge. To show you some of these photographs now. It's interesting also, this is the 70s and these pictures are in black and white. If you were a serious photographer in England in, in the 1970s, you were almost obliged to work in black and white. Colour was the domain of snapshot photography and commercial photography. Uh, this is the ancient order of hen-pecked husbands, <laughs> annual general meeting on Good Friday at Nays Bottom Baptist Chapel, Kepton Bridge. <laughs> Night scene. Uh, this is just down the road from where we lived in Mason Street. When I was moving to Hebner Bridge, one of the things I wanted to do is try and illustrate this whole sense of a community that was very much evident in Hebner Bridge. Because remember, I came from suburban Surrey. Uh, I went to the north in my childhood and was really taken with this notion of a sense of community. So I think one of the things I wanted to try and illustrate was almost like a celebration of the community spirit. And it struck me that the most traditional aspect of life in Hebden Bridge were these small, non-conformist chapels. And it was this that I then decided to hone in on in the latter part of my period there. This is Steep Lane Baptist Chapel anniversary service. The anniversary service is like the birthday of the uh, chapel, and it's the biggest event in the chapel calendar. This is a small chapel called Crimson Dean Methodist Chapel, and I went there and I decided to photograph this on a continual basis, so I went over uh, every Sunday for a period of two years. It's a small chapel right at the edge of the, the valleys there. And this is after the main service, this is the typical congregation. And these were the old farmers that lived up in the north part of these valleys. So all of these farmers we got to know. I worked with my wife, she was uh, doing tape recording. And we went there, visited them all, documented them, and photographed them extensively. This is the spring clean, annual spring clean, um, <coughs> just before the anniversary service. And that's Charlie uh, Greenwood, who sat down here. And here's Charlie up at his farm, which is called Thurish, and here he is putting up curtains for the weekend of the anniversary service. Mm. So the only time in the year they would have curtains up is for the anniversary. Likewise with the hearth, they put a hearth rug down. They felt they should treat themselves to the luxury uh, over that weekend. <laughs> and this work got published about uh, three years ago. It's funny, I had to wait 35 years for it to be published. <laughs> Uh, and the reason why I didn't publish it then is because no one wanted to publish it. It was very straightforward. So after working, doing this very narrative project, I wanted to do something a bit more conceptual. And I came up with this idea of photographing in and around bad weather. 
And this is one of the projects, this is one of the pictures I took early on in the project. This is from 1977. This is the Queen's Silver Jubilee washed out street party. <laughs> Uh, because when you're out photographing and the weather's bad, you worry about getting water in your camera, so I decided I'd go and buy an underwater camera and an underwater flash gun, and this is Ross Common Races. When they sold me the camera, they said I was the only non-swimmer that had ever bought an underwater <laughs> camera. Uh, this is in Ireland. It's in 1980 I moved to Ireland for two years, and the bad weather project uh, straddled both my time in the UK and in Ireland. With the use of this flash gun and photographing particularly in the magic hour, I was able to explore this whole idea of the logs and the snow and the rain, and I quite liked the effect of these and then started to incorporate them more into my pictures. And also I began to think about the whole notion of what it is that photographers are attracted to. We love to photograph things that are very exotic, things that are very dynamic. And I decided to give myself the challenge of doing this project of trying to think of the dullest places possible. <laughs> uh, so I went to motorway service stations, supermarket car parks, just to see if it's possible to take an interesting photograph in a very dull place. <laughs> I also began to understand how subjective photography can be. Look at this picture here taken at night in People's Park in Halifax on a tripod and a few moments later the same scene but taking the flash. So which one is telling the truth? We understand of course the different interpretations of the same scene. So if you acknowledge the photographer has within their grasp the ability to change the way things look, this inherent subjectivity was something I wanted to use and employ in my work a lot more. And this came out as a book in 1982, and this is the first book that I published. And since then, I've done about another 80 or 90 books. <laughs> but I won't be showing you all those tonight. <laughs> and also, I began, a big, I began to be a big collector of photo books. And about 10 to 12 years ago, together with my colleague, Jerry Badger, we wrote these two books, which are the history of photo books. And I did this for a very clear reason, because I believe that in the history of photography, the book is ultimately the most precious vehicle we have. I mean, there are many photographers in this room, and I'm convinced if I asked you all, most of you would have been turned on to be wanting to be a photographer by seeing a particular certain book. While it's a history of photography, which remember is entirely subjective and is constantly changing, is usually written by theoreticians and academics, and they don't understand how important books are to us photographers. So if you like this sort of, um, this double set of volumes, and another one further down the line is if you like, a sort of voice from the ground, a voice from photographers, because my colleague, Jerry Badger, is also a photographer, to say, remember how important they are in the history of photography. And this is volume three, which we did about three years ago. I'll just show you one book from this. This is an interesting book by an Italian photographer called Gian Buttarini. He came to London in the 60s and did a fantastic book about swinging London because uh, many British photographers hadn't realized what a rich subject matter this was. So it took almost many of the foreigners who came to London and to Liverpool in the 60s to show what interesting cities they were and how good they would become photographically. I also work as a curator, and this is uh, our festival, which is the, probably the most important festival in photography. I curated this in 2004, and in 2010, I curated the Brighton Photo Biennale, which is in the UK. Uh, this is a book that I edited for uh, Ivory Press, uh, based in Madrid. It's about a young generation of photographers emerging from Latin America. Uh, this is a very exciting and dynamic um, continent for new photography. And I'm also working with uh, an American publisher called the Nazareli Press. Uh, I'm doing 10 books for them over a period of uh, 10 years. This is book number four. It's by a Dutch photographer called Jan Vanning. It's called Bureaucratics. And he went to eight different countries <laughs> and photographed the bureaucrats in those countries. And if you go to Bolivia and you have a problem, this is the person you've got to go and see. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, this is a book by someone called Peter Mitchell. He was a pioneer of color photography in the UK, but had been rather overlooked. So I was very happy to actually have an opportunity to do a, a, a new book showing uh, the folios and the accumulated work by this important photographer. This is book number seven. No. <laughs> Contrast between the sort of shabby backdrop 
and the sort of domestic activity in the foreground. Uh, the kid in the middle there is, is someone called Paul, in fact, and about five years ago he, he wrote to me and said, uh, Hi, I'm studying graphics at St. Martin's in London, and I'm doing a project about your project. And um, we got into conversation, that's his mother, second on in there, and I sent her a print, so it's very nice to get an email from the baby. <laughs>
and I decided I should try and photograph people I knew who had voted for Mrs. Thatcher. <laughs> uh, so this is the Conservative Party, that's her party. Um, it's the cons Bath Conservatives Young Mid no, Young Conservatives Midsummer Madness Party in Bath. <laughs> Mother and daughter. <laughs> Young family. And here's the reluctant wallet coming out again. <laughs> and my partner was pregnant, and this is a photograph from National Childbirth Trust Antenatal Classes. I'm sure we have something very similar in the States. And uh, she wanted to go to this. I said I'd happily come if I could bring my camera. <laughs> this is the dinner party. And aerobics. <laughs> and this came out as a book in 1989. Now, it was around this time that I, I decided it would be quite interesting to try and work for magazines because this streak in me which has a great populist uh, notion. And it, it struck me that if I'm going to work for magazines, it would be very good to join an agency. So I looked around and thought, well, the most interesting one to try and join would be Magnum Photos. And I then started a rather long process of uh, trying to become a member of Magnum. There was some resistance. In fact, there are some Magnum photographers here tonight who can get full details of that later on. <laughs> Drinks. And uh, <laughs> I did become a magnet photographer in 1994, but what it did do when I became a nominee, which is the first level of membership, it gave me an incredible opportunity to work for magazines. So this, for example, is a German magazine called Tempo, and I just started doing a project about tourism. So it was a fantastic opportunity for me to get uh, someone to send me to different places at their ticket. Uh, and then for me to work on my own project, but also uh, fulfilling a commercial assignment as well. This is for Basler Zeitling. I did a special supplement for the uh, art fair in Switzerland. And uh, rather strangely, as I know virtually nothing about fashion, about uh, 20 years ago, people asked if I would do some fashion photography, and I agreed to do that, and then it built up quite a big folio of fashion work. And about 10 years ago, I was invited to do an exhibition of my fashion work in a, a store in Paris called Bon Marché. And to accompany that, we produced a, a, a catalog, uh, which is in this case called Fashion Magazine. And here I was able to show some of the spreads that I've done over the past years. This is for an Italian magazine called Amica. This is for French L. Uh, we went round uh, Essex, just near to London, with a van full of accessories and bags, and found people on the street. I like this idea of trying to use ordinary people for fashion. <laughs> and then we decided, uh, this is being done with the Magnum Paris office, uh, we decided that I would um, do all of the photographs in the magazine. So I did the social pages, and I did the uh, travel, and the um, and the, even the advertising. So we went to different people like Paul Smith, and they would give us a bag, and then I took the photograph, and then it became a double page spread uh, in the magazine, which helped to pay for the whole project. <laughs> and then the project uh, went to Japan, and we did another supplement. And this is much more recent, this is 2008, this is for The Guardian, this is the left-leaning paper in the UK. And they invited me to do uh, supplements on 10 regional cities in Britain. So it's a fantastic assignment, 160 pages of editorial images. And these supplements were then given free out in the newspaper on a given Saturday. This is the one for Brighton. A lot of portraits, because if you have five days to produce a supplement, you need to have stories and portraits rather than just wandering the streets. You need something more substantial. Occasionally I do advertising. Uh, this is for Ibis Hotels. A lot of this advertising, again, is done from the Magnum office in Paris. 
And this is also for Bon Marche. <laughs> Going back now to the uh, tourism project. <laughs> So this is originally published in 1995. <laughs> this is Venice, of course. And this is Venice in uh, Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Paris in Las Vegas. <laughs> Machu Picchu. I think this illustrates very well, you know, if we think about Machu Picchu, you know, this image of this, this beautiful location, we see it in our magazines and our newspapers, and when we see it, there's never any people there, but when you get there at 7.30 in the morning, uh, there's another thousand people there already trying to clamber onto the same viewpoint. So we have in our head this sort of, uh, this sort of mythology of what a place may look like, especially within tourism, but when you get there, the reality is quite different. So that initial tension between those two poles is really what I'm trying to illustrate in my own work. This is Angkor Wat. And this is um, in Japan. This is the biggest indoor beach in the world. It's called Ocean Dome. Just down the road is the real sea, but there's no one there. <laughs> And this is uh, in Barcelona, this is the, the park. And this is the dragon that they all come and see. And you can see it's so mobbed by people, you can hardly see it. And now, of course, we have the uh, selfie stick <laughs> in Venice. And, of course, the selfie. In 1995, uh, I bought a different camera and, and lens. It's a, a macro lens with a ring flash, a, a combination usually associated with, with, with uh, medical photography. And it, this has this amazing ability to come in very close with uh, it's a light on either side of the lens. So you get this sort of studio type of feel to it. So the first project that I decided to do was an exploration about British food. Because here's a subject that's full of prejudice as you can possibly imagine, because food in Britain has a very bad reputation, and yet we've had a real food renaissance. But I made it my job to try and find the worst examples of British food. Disneyland, Tokyo. 
So returning back to the UK now, uh, this is a body of work which I did between something like 2010 and 2015. Uh, this is an area called the Black Country, which is near Birmingham, which is the second city in the UK. Uh, and I was working with a company called Multistory, and I did a lot of work there over this four-year period. Uh, this is in Dudley. This is a rock-making machine, a rock-making factory, sorry, where they roll rock. Rock is this pink stick with words written in it. I don't know if you get it in the States. This is in West Bromwich. This is a Christian food bank. <laughs> uh, this is a disco in Walsall. Uh, this is a football fan, a soccer fan. This is Wolverhampton Wanderers. And one of the things that's reinvigorated uh, the, the black country has been this um, immigration from Poles, from Sikhs, from uh, different uh, communities around the world. So I went to their temples and photographed in these. And this is one of the traditional industries of the black country. It's where they literally used to make chains. Uh, and now this small factory here used to be 50 people. Now it's down to two people, father and son. And they work some of that three days a week. So it's a very sad decline. This is the new shopping center. And when we exhibited this, um, we, we put up the, what I call the archive. So if you do a commission or a project, you produce uh, you know, small 10 by 8 prints, and then you maybe have 500 of these, 400 of these, and you make a final selection of the 30 pictures that you want to show. But rather than just show the 30 pictures, we decided to show the whole of the archive, the whole of the selection. And people are really fascinated to see uh, you know, so many photographs. And, and in the end, I produce an archive box. This is like a box with the 400 pictures in, everything's captioned. And this is what will be left in the community in the Sandwell Library. So in 50 years' time, uh, I think the value of the archive will have more value than just, say, 30 prints. So it, it's a lot of information here. That, and I do feel a responsibility as a documentary photographer to, to get as much of this information down as possible. And here's Norman with his um, with the copy of his book. This is Norman's prize leak as part of Samuel's show. So this is a, a, a chapter that I'm just concluding at the moment. It's about the British establishment. And, and this is another additional uh, sort of body of work about Britain. This is a public school called uh, Christ Hospital. It's in Sussex. And here they wear this sort of very Tudor uniform with yellow socks and these black tunics. It's heavily subsidized by the city of London, by private people. And so there's a lot of deprived or poorer black kids and from the sort of east end of London that go there. This is what's called the Grecian's Ball. This is the uh, ball for the final party for the six formers, just before they leave college or leave, uh, yes, leave the public school to go to university. And this is the Grecian's Ball. They know how to party. <laughs> this is Harrow. This is one of the two most famous public schools in the UK, Eton and Harrow, and if you pass a master in the street, you have to go like this to sort of acknowledge their presence. And Harrow had this very strange uh, sort of game of football. It's very muddy, as you can see. And uh, this is one of the players. And half an hour later, I did his portrait of the same guy uh, back in his, um, his own uh, school. And this is a project I did about the City of London. So the City of London has all kinds of traditions going on, which are, it's a somewhat feudal society. Uh, and I, although the, the City of London is incredibly modern, it also is very feudal and very old fashioned at the same time. This is the Lord Mayor of London. This is different to the Mayor of actual London, who is voted for, but this is the elected uh, Lord Mayor, who just does it for one year. And this is just the Mayor of the City of London. This is the Mayor's Parade. Uh, 
And this is one of the many livery companies there, which look like a, a cross between uh, trade unions and Freemasons. And this is the Queen. She's a member of the Draper's livery, so this is her on the 650th anniversary lunch. This is the Bishop of London. And this is swan upping, and this is where the, uh, the livery companies and the Queen's swan master go onto the River Thames and they ring the new born uh, swans, which are called signets, and they give them a ring, so they're all sort of, uh, there's an inventory of all the swans on the, on, the, on the River Thames. The only person who's legally allowed to eat swan is the Queen, in fact. And that, but I don't know that she ever does. And this is Oxford University. I've just finished a project about this. This is the uh, Vice Chancellor. This is uh, Queer Fest. This is at Wadham. This is one of the many colleges. Oxford University consists of something like 42 different colleges. This is Brasno's College. This is the college that David Cameron attended. So part of my exploration is to really show this sort of uh, the establishment and how Oxford, if you go there, it really does help you become part of the British establishment and you, and you do things like become Prime Minister. This is uh, Maudlin Hall in Cambridge. And when you, when you sit in the exams in Oxford, you have a different coloured carnation depending on at which point during the exam system you are. If it's your first exam, it's a different colour to the, the last exam, which is where you had a, a red carnation. And then afterwards, you go for trashing. So as you leave your final exam, your friends are there greeting you with foam and <coughs> champagne, and you get completely trashed. And then you go and jump in the river. <laughs> Okay, this is the last project I want to show you tonight. This is an ongoing project called Auto Portrait. Uh, and this is really like a celebration and a study of different studio portraits around the world. Uh, and I've been doing this project for something like 25 years now. <laughs> and uh, this all started as I went around, I do a lot of traveling, I go into a photographer's studio and think I really like those photos and uh, you couldn't actually take them because there's someone else's pictures. So I thought what I will do is volunteer myself to have my own photograph taken. And so I go in and say, please, can you do one of me like this? <laughs> so two things have happened in this 25 year period. First off, uh, the whole of photography has changed from analog to digital, so this incredible uh, upheaval in the whole world of photography. And secondly, I've got a lot older. <laughs> and the camera is incredibly accurate at demonstrating age incredibly well. So this is 25 years ago in Jamaica. <laughs> this is Benidorm in Spain. This is... Uh, Studio Hanoi in Havana. And this is a, a black and white photograph that's been hand coloured. This is a, a technique now which is entirely dyed. There may be one place in the world where you can still have it done North Korea. And this is Pyongyang. This is from Brazil. This is a technique where they put an oil wash over the photographs. And uh, this is uh, Mexico. Um, together with my friend Graciela Turbatai, she found the last person that was still doing this hand carving technique, which is particularly strong in the 1960s. Uh, so we had a few portraits done there. <laughs> Barcelona. This is the world of 
folk in uh, Atlanta. <laughs> You'll notice that um, I'm always very serious in this very last. I decided to be absolutely uh, the right thing to do is always strike the same pose of being very serious. Many photographers try to get me to smile. <laughs> <laughs> this is in Dubai. So you can see now the only limitation is the imagination of the photographer.
But I'm actually quite glad that it's not easy to do, you know, because it really does sort out the people that have that ability to overcome that intimidation and fear. You know, because if you really want to do it, and I really want to do it, you just have to go and do it. And of course, you're going to have occasional people, and in, you're right, it's so far that uh, this trend is probably increasing rather than decreasing as people become more paranoid about rights and all these other issues. But as far as I know in America, as is the case in the UK, you can still photograph people on the street. I mean, there was that famous Philip Lauderdale Corsier case, but I, I think, generally speaking, all you street photographers haven't had any repercussions from legal things with people. I mean, I think in America it's still a pretty free society, isn't it? Yeah. Thank God for that, you know. So this, who knows what's going to happen in the future, so go out and take the pictures now. Well, yeah. That's the kind of skip. Exactly. Any other questions? All right, so I want to uh, make sure that everybody stays here. We're going to do the uh, award ceremony, so we're going to announce the